Okay, so we had a little problem because um, I have in my hand the world's first USB flash card, flash drive. Uh, this is dating back from 1943. It has a memory storage of 128 megabytes. And evidently there are no other machines right now that work with this device aside from my own computer. So we'll put this in a museum somewhere so people can admire it. Um, are there any, any questions about anything from last time? Okay, so today I'm going to talk mostly about the, oh, I wanted to mention a couple of things before I start. So, um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk largely about the geophysical features of Antarctica and the ice, because since we're using Antarctica as our detection medium, we're using Antarctica as our target, um, for cosmic ray experiments, it's obviously important that we understand the properties, especially the electromagnetic properties of ice. Well, it's very interesting, actually, because of the fact that Antarctica represents something that you read about in textbooks. You read about semi-infinite dielectrics, and of course, Antarctica is one of the few places where you can truly find a semi-infinite dielectric. So it's a very good place to do studies of electromagnetic phenomena. And we've done several as a uh, prelude, several studies, several experiments that are important to understanding the ability of our experiments uh, or the sensitivity of our experiments in Antarctica. So let's see, before I start, I ask you to fill out the um, percent understandability uh, page here. This is the distribution of um, the responses that I got. So it's obviously a non-Gaussian distribution. Uh, there's many of you that understand 100% of what I'm saying, which is very surprising because when I listen to what I'm saying, I don't understand what I'm saying. One of you understands 110% of what I'm saying, which is also extremely, extremely good. Um, I think the interesting thing about this distribution is that it's obviously discretized. I asked you to tell me what percent you understood, and nobody wrote down numbers like 64.731%, even though that's probably the right number. <laughs> so you wrote down 60% or 70% or 80%. Otherwise, we have large statistical fluctuations. I think the unfortunate, most unfortunate thing about this distribution is that unfortunately, as you see, it goes from about 5% to 115%, and there's one underflow, um, which is unfortunate, but hopefully that person is, uh, is still with us today. Okay, so I'll, I'll try my best um, to maybe speak a little bit more um, clearly, although since I, I don't speak to say. I speak New York ski, which is different than American ski, so it's maybe a little bit difficult to pick up my accent, but I'll, I'll try to elucidate, enunciate, excuse me, as best I can. Okay, um, since someone asked me yesterday, I wanted to make one more comment about the, the difference between detecting Cherenkov radiation with ultraviolet light with photomultiplier tubes, which is the standard technique, versus detecting Cherenkov radiation in the long wavelength regime using um, radio waves. And I want to remind you that photomultiplier tubes, 
that as Lewis used to say, are used predominantly in experiments where you are measuring the ultraviolet light from one particle. So if we imagine that there is a muon, there's a single muon, and it's traveling with V greater than C naught. There's a so-called shock wave, and in the standard picture, which you no doubt see, there's this shock front that looks like this. And the transverse width, I mean the thickness of that shock front is obviously related to literally the size of the muon track. So the muon track is very, very small. It has practically zero width. It's like a little pencil beam. And therefore, the width of the shock front, which is essentially related to the Fourier transform of that transverse scale, is also very thin. So what that means is that if I have my photo multiplier tube here, there is a very fast and rapid shock that comes by, nearly instantaneous. And that's for measuring one particle. However, in our case, it's more complicated because in our case, what we're measuring is not a track of infinitesimal width. What we're measuring is the superposition of lots of tracks. And the transverse scale, again, is determined by the so-called Molinear radius. So the tracks in this shower, the particles in this shower, have a transverse width which is by definition the Molière radius, and it's about 10 centimeters. It's written here. It's 11 or 12 centimeters in ice. And therefore, the, um, the Fourier transform of that means that this shower or this Tarenkov cone is not infinitesimally thin, but has some thickness. It has some angular width. Well, that should be reasonable, because clearly if I, I can think about the particles at the top of the shower, they're radiating a Trankov cone, it looks like this, the particles at the bottom are radiating a Trankov cone, which is displaced slightly. So, the radio signal that is received is not as sharp as the signal that comes from an optical Trankov first. That's the that's the first comment. The second comment is that the width of this so-called Cherenkov cone <clears throat> depends on the Molière radius. So if you are contemplating doing an experiment to measure radio wave Cherenkov radiation in different materials, different media, you should take into account the fact, for instance, that salt has a much narrower width. So the width here is smaller. And in fact, in the United States, and maybe even here in Russia, since you guys have so much oil, there are geological features that are called salt domes. I have no idea what the I don't know how you say this in Russian, salt dome. Is anybody familiar with this, a salt dome? A salt dome is um, a place where, if you imagine, here's the surface of the earth, there's a large pool of oil. And very often, near the oil, there is adjacent to it a large salt basin. And this salt basin, is often very, very pure. The typical dimensions are on the order of maybe 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers by even 10 kilometers. So there are huge deposits of very pure salt. And in fact, at one time, well, in fact, before we did 
a lot of work in Antarctica, we thought about trying to put detectors and sensors in these so-called salt domes. However, in the United States, since we worship capitalism, there's a problem because there's someone who owns this land on top of the salt dome. And there's someone else who owns the land on top of this piece of the salt dome. So in America, we have something which is called surface rights. So, есть какой-то человек, который действительно имеет этот землю над этот солнце, как сказать, ну, этот место. И нам нужно было бы платить, но гораздо большая сумма денег этому человеку и его соседу, и ее соседу, перед тем, как мы можем бурова прямо в это место. So, we, and I'll go here, and we went to Antarctica, where the ice is free. We need to put it on the ticket. The other comment I wanted to make is that, again, in comparing the sensitivity of a optical a photomultiplier tube-based experiment with a radio wave-based experiment, you have to take into account the fact. So let's imagine here is here's the ice. So here's Antarctica. It's about three kilometers thick. And let's imagine that there is a neutrino that interacts at this point, and you have two sensors. One is a photomultiplier tube sensor, and one is a radio wave antenna. Well, if the interaction happens here, clearly the ice has to be sufficiently clear, so that you can measure so that the rates of the signal, either ultraviolet light or radio waves, reaches your antenna or your photomultiplier to you. So one of the first things that we did was we measured the so-called attenuation length in um, in in ice. And in fact, there's there's two pieces to this. There's two components. One is literally the um, the, the scattering, the uh, the length of absorption. I guess that would be the in the And the other is the length for scattering in a cyanide. And both of those are important for the attenuation length. I'll talk about this in a second. For the attenuation length, what we did to measure this in the we had two antennas, and we literally bounced radio waves off of the bedrock, and we measured the return signal. It's very straightforward. For the scattering length in the Rasayania, um, there the scattering is basically so-called Raleigh scattering. It's the scheme mechanism is why the, the sky is blue. And the scattering of Sanya goes as one over lambda fourth. That's the standard Raleigh formula. Again, this is why the sky is blue. So you see that the scattering effect is much more significant. There's much more scattering for short wavelength ultraviolet light than long wavelength radio waves. It's practically non-existent because lambda is so large in the radio frequency regime. Okay, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Okay, so, so again, mostly today I'll be talking about the geophysical features of the ice, and I'll talk a little bit, and that will lead me a little bit into a discussion of the cosmic background, with which you're probably already experts and familiar. But I'll remind you, because there's so much work that goes on at the South Pole, which is focused on measuring the so-called CMB. All right, so this is what Antarctica looked like 20,000 years ago at the peak of the last glaciation. The ice thickness at that time was probably around 8 kilometers thick. 
that eight kilometer is worth of ice. And this is what it looks like um, today. So here is, let's see, over here, here is McMurdo Station. Uh, yeah, here's McMurdo, which is where that, um, which is where Scott's base is. Uh, this is the so-called Trans-Antarctic Range, um, and the South Pole is somewhere, somewhere over there. And the ice itself, of course, what we're interested in is understanding the electromagnetic properties of the ice, and and. The ice itself is primarily, so this is a phase diagram of ice. It is primarily in the familiar form of ice 1H, which is the form of ice that you have the water in your, in your freezer. And the, um, what's somewhat interesting, so ice 1H is standard snowflake ice. So it's a standard hexagon. And one of the things which is known about ice 1H, about this hexagon, is that the, uh, the index of refraction velocity of propagation of electromagnetic waves can change if this, um, if this crystal is stretched. So if this crystal is stretched to something that looks like this, there will be a difference in the velocity of light along that axis compared to, call oh, that C1 and C2. Uh, in English, this is called birefringence. I think in Russian, it's called um, coefficient uh, I'm not mistaken. So you're probably familiar with this phenomenon. It's also true of sugar molecules. And this turns out to be important for what follows. Now, we're also contemplating doing experimentation using not ice on the Earth, but also ice on the moons, the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So that would be uh, Enceladus, that would be uh, Ganymede, uh, Callisto, and of course Europa, which are covered with this ice sheet of somewhere between 30 to 60 or 70 kilometers thickness. And there, the, uh, the phase of the ice at the bottom is probably different. It's not ice 1H, it's probably ice 2 or maybe ice 3, depending on where you are in, in the ice sheet or the ice cap around those moons. And one of the things we're trying to understand is how different the ice on a moon of Jupiter or Saturn might be, how different it might be relative to the ice that we're familiar with on the Earth. Okay, now, another thing which is important about doing these sorts of studies is that, as you probably know, the Standard ice has this odd property that it is actually less dense than water. So the density of standard ice is about 0 0.927 times the water. However, um, if you think about the ice in Antarctica, there is a, so if we imagine the whole ice thickness is about 2.85 kilometers. The upper ice is mostly sort of loose snow. So each year there's about 
uh, about 10 centimeters of new snow that packs on top of the ice sheet itself. And as time goes on, of course, it becomes denser and denser and denser, and eventually at a depth of something like, so at Z equals 150 meters or so, at that depth, the ice achieves its asymptotic density of 0 0.927 times the density of water. However, in this region, the ice has not yet reached its, it's being packed. It's getting denser and denser, so it's denser here, and it's less dense up there. Okay, so that makes sense. So what is the profile, what's the density profile of the ice? Well, I can sort of model it as I would the density profile of the atmosphere. And, of course, it's not a gas, it's not even a fluid, but I can use the fact that there's a well-defined scale height, and I can write something like Vp, is something like rho g dz. So this is the standard expression for hydrostatic equilibrium. And since, of course, dv is equal to n kt, and p is a proportional to n over v kt, or p is just proportional to rho, so that tells me that d rho goes as rho dz, which makes sense, and leads me to the conclusion that the density profile with depth is going to look something like an exponential. So I should have some exponential form that describes how the density varies with Depth. It will be less, de less dense here, more dense, more dense here, and again, the density should in increase exponentially, just based on the fact, just based on this, this simple argument. And the how do you measure the density? Well, you can do it in two ways. You can literally drill a hole into the ice. You can make a little squashing, and you can pull out some ice, and you just weigh it. You put it on a scale, and you see how much it weighs. You just make a chart of that. The other thing that you can do, and this is what we did, is you can take a radio transmitter and a radio receiver, and you send radio waves, and you put them in two holes, so you would the progeny. And you have two antennas, one is a transmitter, one is a pionic, and you send radio waves and you measure the velocity of travel from here to here. Because the velocity will just depend on the density. So the velocity, so C goes as 1 over rho. The higher the density, the higher the density of ice, the smaller the velocity of propagation. So you can just figure it out. And that's, that's exactly what we did. So we did, we did this experiment, and this is in fact what we measured. So this is the index per fraction, coefficient gelomania, and this is the surface. At the surface, the index per fraction is about 1.38, and then it begins to approach the asymptotic value of 1.782, which is the asymptotic value for firm ice, for hard ice. Now, there's an interesting consequence of the fact that the ice has a variable, has a variable density, a variable with a density that varies with depth. And that's the following. Let's suppose I have a receiver up here. And let's suppose.
suppose I have a transmit over here, and let's suppose I shoot a radio wave directly towards the receiver. So I start out with a, so my transmitter has xz equal, let's say, minus 200 meters, minus 200 meters. So here's x, and here's z. And my receiver is at zero, zero. And I aim a little laser, well, a radio, directly at my receiver. Where does it land? Does it land at the receiver? Does it land here? Or does it land here? Let me say the question. Plus, следующий. Скажем, что у меня есть какая-то передача внутри видео. И я у меня есть какая-то радиоволны, которые я могу стрелять прямо в этот приемник. Этот радиоволна, он будет попасть здесь или здесь или здесь. Here's submarine one. 
course, these are peaceful submarines like the one we have today. And here's submarine two. And similarly, here the the uh, the velocity of light has the opposite profile. So radio waves will bend like this. And there are regions where this submarine will not be viewed by that submarine. It's the same phenomenon as um, in, my, in my misspent youth. There must be a word for this in Russian. My misspent youth. How do you say that in Russian? Hmm? Misspent youth. Misspent youth. You know, literally, but there's probably an expression for it in Russian. There's not an expression. Maybe, maybe all of you do the right things. Maybe most of you see what I am doing. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. But for us, no one has done it. How? Just the right thing. Yes, the right thing. Yes, the right thing. Yes, the right thing. Потрачені молодості. Не совсем потрачені, но напрасно. So in my напрасно, і потрачені молодості, молодості. I um I I hitchhike, and I don't know how you say this in Russian. Hitchhike. It's sort of like uh, you have this thing called office stop, but it's different. In America, you can get on a highway, you get on a chasse. And the car comes by and it picks you up and it takes you to your next destination. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you all know that. 42. Autostop. No, it's похоже на автостоп. But it's not, it's not. Autostop, вам нужно платить или нет? Oh, you don't have to pay. Oh, so you can do the same thing. Okay. So in my, in the the attraction of the wall, you understand. I hitchhiked from, um, from New York, where I live, to. Uh, to California. It was a big adventure. And I remember, uh, and it was July, it was very hot, it was a very hot place, especially in, in July in the Midwest. And I was somewhere in uh, Iowa, and nobody stopped for me in the period of a whole day. Well, that's because Americans are not Flint friendly, you know that. So nobody stopped for me, and I remember very clearly looking down at the highway. So you look down at the highway, and you see what looks like a little um, pool. Luga, yeah? You see what looks like a little pool? Luga. What looks like a little pool? You've seen this, perhaps. What, what is that? Sorry? Mirage. No, but what, what, what is it that you're actually seeing? Oblux. Yeah. Oblux. It's an oblux. It's, it's, it's a cloud. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. But it's an oblux over here that might have some water or something. And of course, what happens is that the index of refraction, because the index of refraction of air depends on temperature, very close to the black asphalt highway, the index of refraction is very low. The air is hot. Up higher, the air is colder, and the index of refraction is correspondingly higher. So instead of, so what, the, so what this image does is it takes a path that goes like this. Again, it's the same effect here, the same effect there. So this thing called a mirage is all is all exactly the same, the same effect. Okay. Now, as I said before, so what so what we so what we spent a lot of time doing is understanding the geophysical properties of the Antarctic ice. And what we did to do this was we put an antenna. So we had a radio wave antenna on the surface, <coughs> and we sent radio wave signal, 
and reflect it off of the rock underneath the ice and back up to the surface. And what we did is we changed the polarization. So we had polarized antennas and we rotated the polarization of our transmitter and receiver. And very interestingly, as you rotate the polarization of your transmitter and receiver, so here's the surface, here's the bedrock, you're setting on the radio waves, that's one polar, and then you have another one which goes like this, and you measure the reflected signal. And very interestingly, the reflected signal depends on the polarization. So if the polarization is like this, the echo time, the time that it takes to go from the surface, reflect off the bedrock and come back, is something like 33,900 nanoseconds. And if you rotate it, you see that the echo time shifts by something like 50 nanoseconds. And this is exactly that effect which we did not expect this birefringence, this coefficient durchfrierungenia, and we were seeing it here. In fact, it's not exactly like that. In fact, there's actually two signals because you're projecting your polarization onto the preferred axis. So there's some basis in the ice, and that basis is defined by the direction of the ice flow. I'll talk about this in a second. So the ice, the entire ice sheet is moving. And that movement extends the ice 1H crystals and produces this asymmetry in the, in the, um, in the, in the speed of light, or an asymmetry in the um, index of refraction. Now, of course, you can also directly determine the attenuation length from this graph. How do you do that? Well, it's very simple. So you start off with, so here's your transmitter, and here's your receiver, and you measure the signal for a in-air transmission, which is essentially lossless, and then you turn them around, and you measure the signal through ice, and, of course, V1 over V2 is something like a 1 over, so if this is D air, if this is D ice, so D air is the total travel through air, and D ice is the total travel through ice. Um, v ice over V air, so V ice is the signal you measure through the through the ice path, the air is the signal that you measure through the air path. Well, it's something like 1 over D ice minus D air times the exponential of minus D ice minus D air all over the attenuation length. So, if the attenuation length is infinite, obviously, all you see is basically 1 over R, which is the expected voltage dependence. Okay? If the attenuation length is very small, then this term dominates. So, this is exactly what we did. We measured, we took this signal, we compared it to a direct path, and remarkably, you conclude that the attenuation length, this value, is on the order of one to two kilometers for uh, a frequency of about 500 megahertz. Well, that's pretty remarkable that you can send a radio wave through one and a half kilometers of ice with almost no absorption almost no attenuation. You clearly can't do that through the ground because there are too many impurities in the ground. 
there are metals, and there are other things that are not RF transparent, not radio transparent. But you can do that with ice, and that's the only reason all these experiments work. Okay, um, so this is the same picture that I showed you here. Uh, so this is parallel to the ice flow direction, and this is perpendicular to the ice flow direction, and here's that time shift. Uh, this is a spectrogram, you see that most of the power, this is in gigahertz, most of the power is at about, uh, is peaked at something like 150 to 250 megahertz. It's not so important. Yes? Does this difference occur to the ice flow entirely? So if there, if, if, uh, there were no ice flow, would there be uh, this, this difference? Um, so it is it, it, it not, if you don't have a nice and you have a difference in um, density, doesn't, no. doesn't ice in horizontal and vertical direction look different? Oh, uh, so yeah, so if you, so, yeah, so there's, um, so you're right, so there are, there are in principle three different directions. So if you think about the, so if you think about a crystal, there are two directions in the horizontal plane, and then there's one direction in the vertical, the vertical plane. And you're right. In principle, there is a difference in propagation velocity for the vertical propagation versus the horizontal propagation. In our experiment, we're only concerned about the horizontal propagation, so we didn't worry about it. Even still, if to make a difference for the vertical polarization, you need some mechanism that will somehow align all of the ice crystals that they're lying down. So you need, you need to have something so that they're all in the same plane. So that there's a difference in, in that case, if, if they're all random, the distribution is random, then you'll never see any, any difference. There has to be something that generates an asymmetric distribution of the crystal alignment, crystal orientation. In our, in our measurements, we were only sensitive to, um, to cases where the polarization vector was in the horizontal plane. As you're, you're certainly right that you could have um, instances where there's an asymmetry in the vertical plane as well, but we did not measure that. Okay? Are you sure? You'll be okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so, um, where else did this? Now, one of the things that's, so if you remember from this plot, you see this asymmetry at a depth of 34,000 nanoseconds, which corresponds to the very bottom of the ice sheet. In fact, you can look at, you can actually see radio, radar reflections from shallower depths. So this is, at 14,000 nanoseconds. So this is a depth which corresponds to something which is in here. So what is reflecting radio waves from inside the ice sheet? We need some sort of mirror. I'm looking for the zircala to the atrazit radio volni vnutri oda sam. And what kind of radar reflectors do we have? Well, it turns out that whenever there is a volcanic vulcan, whenever there's a volcanic explosion, there's a lot of um, uh, sulfites, uh, uh, SO4, um, that ultimately shows up as sulfuric acid. Uh, and for instance, those sulfites produce Layers. Whenever there is a big volcanic eruption, this is how people figure out the Earth's volcanic history. What they do is that they look at the cores 
at the ice cores, the ice that's been taken, for instance, from Vostok and other places, and they see little layers of ionic deposition. And those ionic depositions come from volcanic explosions. And those small ionic depositions can serve as radio <coughs> reflectors. So you see these in this, these are called so, so called internal layers, and we see these very clearly in the ice. And what's interesting is that here all of the radar reflections, they're all synchronous. So up till here, there's no asymmetry. All of the asymmetry is generated down below. Well, how do you, how does that happen? Well, what the ice cube experiment has done is that they very carefully put, so ice cube is drilled holes, we'll talk about this tomorrow probably, and they put sensors into these holes in the ice. And they have very precise positioning. So they can figure out how their holes move relative to each other. And they've determined that the profile, whoop, where is it? Yeah. So they've determined that the profile of the ice movement is such that there's a so-called strain that's generated in the lower thousand meters or so of the ice sheet. So what that means is that if I had to draw off the velocity profile, it would look something like this. So this is z, and this is velocity. And as you get closer and closer to the bottom, the ice moves slower and slower. Why? Because it's stuck. It's stuck to the bedrock. There's rock, and it's uneven, and it's hard. There's a lot of friction, Tanya, down here, and it's hard for the ice to move there. So consequently, there's this strain profile, the strain tensor. And that strain tensor is, we believe, what is causing this stretching of the ice crystals and producing this biofilming effect in the bottom. Turns out this is important for neutrino detector experiments because what it means is that instead of getting one pure signal from a radio wave, we have a basis and the signal will project according to the two orthogonal axes of the basis. So we get two signals in our trigger. Now, as I said before, the ice, so the ice moves. How much does it move? So this is, this is the South Pole. This is literally the bottom of the planet. And one of the things that's interesting, so how do you say Polka? How do you say it in Russian? Polka. Pole. Polka? Polis. Polis. But, but the actual pole is a stick. Polis. Got os. Okay. So there isn't a different word for, for literally that the stick is just called an os. Okay. So the funny thing is, is that the first time I was at the South Pole, I walked over to it and I looked at it and I thought, wow. This is the bottom of the planet. This, this, is, this is literally at the usually of poles. And I held it, I touched it, I get struggle, and then I pulled on it. And in fact, I lifted it all the way up. <laughs> I thought, wow, and you know, I looked around. I have the South Pole in my hands. It's not in very far. <laughs> As you wish. Um, and of course, because America owns the world, we have the American flag here. Um, so this is, this is, for instance, the South Pole from this year. This is the South Pole from last year. And this is the South Pole from 2013. Well, 
It's pretty remarkable. How did the South Pole move? Как он, как Южный Полос of Petermasteel? Well, of course, it didn't Petermasteel. The entire ice sheet is moving. So all of the ice is, I mean, the bottom of the planet, um, the bottom of the planet, the summit of Yuzhny Polis, one condition of But the ice uh, is in motion, it's a vision. And this is how much it moves in the space of about one year. So it moves about 10 meters in one year. Why does the ice sheet move? There's a chem on the vision set. It moves because if you look, if you go back to this, let's see. If you go back to this picture, up here, the ice is thickest. Up here, the thickness, moving in, chitiri, filling up. At the South Pole, the Yugo Pole is here, filling up. So the entire ice sheet is slowly, there's a gravitational gradient. So the ice itself is moving under the influence of that gravitational gradient. And that gravitational gradient results in a movement of about 10, 10 meters a year in at the South, the south Pole. Okay. Uh, all right. The, so at the South Pole, the ice moves at about 10 meters per year. There are other places where, remarkably, the ice moves much faster. I think about, when I think about ice and glaciers, I think of them as static and not moving. But there are places where, for instance, the ice is moving up to a kilometer a year. Here it's moving one centimeter every 10 minutes. Those are called ice streams. And they're just places where there's a lot of pressure which is pushing the ice out towards the sea. There's a lot of concern, of course, that if you look over here in West Antarctica, particularly um, at the Ron Ice Shelf, there's a lot of outflow of the ice. And when you hear about um, the effect of global warming, global natural and the effect on the ice sheet is particularly because there's so much ice which is leaving and is not being not being replaced. Okay, so the ice itself is is in motion, and what else is interesting is that underneath the ice, as you probably know, there are places where there uh, there's literally water. What time is it? Let's go up to the Okay. So there are places under the ice where there's literally water. So you're probably famous with this Lake Vostok. This Lake Vostok is literally a big lake underneath about four kilometers of ice. And there are other places where there have been um, where there is liquid water underneath the underneath the ice sheet. So here is a picture of um, that I got off of one of your websites. Uh, so the lake itself is pretty big. It's about 600 meters uh, deep. It has a um, total volume of ice which is equal to one of America's great lakes. It's a big lake. And of course, what's interesting about it is that when they drilled this hole in the Gilly Boreal, with the Skrajna, and they actually no bacteria, no jizen, priamo, olio, vida, cascasa, So they found living bacteria inside the ice. Well, that's interesting. And what people are particularly interested in is the possibility that there is life inside this lake. Now, 
you're probably familiar with this because this was a Russian project, but in order to keep, so they drilled this hole in Buryolet Tskvajna, and they had to be sure that the hole did not close because of the hydrostatic pressure. If they drilled the hole, it's going to be Buryolet Tskvajna. И это совсем не было полон, сам ничего. До конца концов он будет um, закрыт из, из гидростатического давления. So they have to put something in the hole to keep it from closing. Well, what do they use? They use either glycol or they can use kerosene. And so there is stuff inside this hole, which if they actually went all the way through, all that stuff is going to fall into the lake and contaminate the life in the lake. So they came up with this very, very elaborate and clever scheme in order to somehow create a little puncture. So they got through into the lake, they pulled out some water without contaminating it. I, I don't remember how they did it, but somehow they did it two years ago, and up until now, uh, they haven't released the biological results, or the bio they, they haven't released the results on a biological study of whether or not there's actually life in the lake. Maybe somebody else knows, but I haven't, I haven't heard anything about it. Um, now, the reason why this is so interesting on its own is because there are other places in the, uh, in the solar system, um, in particular this is Europa. So Europa also has ice on the outside and there's water underneath all of that ice. So underneath 10 to 80 kilometers thickness of ice, there is water underneath. Now, that leads to the question, why is it that the water underneath Lake Vostok does not freeze, and why is it that the water underneath this ice sheet does not freeze? What is it which generates, is it because there is a kind of teplota, is it because of the water between Europe and the Zemirza, как этот um, um, отличается от uh, теплота, который um, из того, что uh, вода в озеро, он тоже не замерзает. Well, the mechanisms are much different. So the heat, the heat that keeps this lake, the heat that keeps this lake um, water and not ice is, of course, just the heat in the earth itself. And the heat in the Earth itself mostly comes from the decay of uranium and thorium. So it's mostly um, U-235 and thorium, I forget the isotope, but it's mostly uranium and thorium decay. This is why if you go into a mine, it gets hotter and hotter as you go down into the Earth's crust. It's just because there's decay, radioactive decay of uranium and thorium. It's the same thing true as here. So the water is being heated from below just by the decay of radioactive elements in the crust. In the case of, let's see, so here's a picture of Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn, that's why there's a picture of Saturn there. Uh, and it has, let me see if I have a picture. Here's Ganymede, which is similar. So, um, Ganymede has a has ice. There's rock mantle with ice, and then there's a saltwater ocean, and then there's this hexagonal ice one. So these are two different forms of ice. And here, well, at least for the case of simpler to think about um, Enceladus. So why is it that there's water underneath the ice sheet of Enceladus? Why doesn't that water freeze. What is it that's producing? Well, 
It's um, yeah. So there's there's gravitational flexing of the planet. Jania, uh, da Jato, jato. So there is gravitational jato. Okay. So the planet is literally um, flexing, and that produces friction. Jania, and is it because of the friction, the water, the ice is heated from underneath. And in fact, there's a um, there's a proposal to uh, to put an orbiter around Enceladus um, in order to well, there's a couple of proposals uh, to put an orbiter around Enceladus and try and figure out a way to get at this water and again see if there are see if there's something living in that water. Everywhere we look, at least on Earth. If you mix water and organic material, you find life. So there's reason to suspect that the same would be true here. Okay, so that's a brief resume of, um, of the geophysical features of at least ice and the planet. All right, um, so. In principle, the next segment has to do with the cosmic wave background. I think what I'll do is that instead of starting it today, I'll just start it tomorrow. So tomorrow, we'll talk about the cosmic wave background. And again, you're probably very familiar with this. Maybe, you're, maybe you are familiar with it. You're probably familiar with it. But I'll review it anyway because it's so interesting. And then on Thursday and Friday, we'll talk about uh, particle astrophysics and the detection of ultra high energy particles. Okay, any questions? Okay, all right. Thank you for your attention.